two of which are represented in um, this talk. So we had an election in Rheinland-Pfalz and we had an election in Baden-Württemberg with different outcomes. And we will talk about that and what these outcomes might potentially mean for the national elections. So I would like to, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation is a, a German political foundation with offices around the world. We work for social justice, freedom, and uh, we are very much connected also to the US and to American partners. One of our very good partners is the Center for American Progress. And we are very grateful that the great Max Bergman from the Center of American Progress has agreed to moderate this session today to, well, also try to tease out what this election year might mean for transatlantic relations, uh, for international cooperation, and even maybe it has a meaning for progressives in North America. So thank you very much for everybody out there that joins us this morning, this afternoon. Thank you to Thomas Hitchler, MP from Rheinland-Pfalz. And thank you to Isabel Kadematori from Mannheim. She's a city councillor there and aspires to be a member of parliament. And uh, I hope we will have an interesting hour of discussion. I hand it over to Max Bergman. Thank you. Thank you, Knud. And uh, thanks so much for, for asking me to moderate this panel. Uh, oftentimes, American elections are treated as sort of, you know, elections that sort of captivate the world, given the outsized impact the United States can have on the world. And I think the most important election this year is in Germany. And the because the impact of Germany, not only on Europe, but in the world is, is, is so immense. And so uh, it's my honor to, to moderate this panel. Let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Thomas Hitchler is a member of the Bundestag and currently sits on the Defense Committee. Uh, before that, he served in a number of political roles, including as advisor to the Lord Mayor of Landau, chairman of the SPD Parliamentary Group in Herxheim Municipal Council, and was personal assistant to the president of the Structural and Approval Directorate South in Neustadt, uh, and also as head of the EAP, an institution to support business startups. Thomas, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and I'll hand, hand it off to you in a moment, but first let me um, introduce Isabel Katamantori, uh, who is a Mannheim city councilor uh, and is running for the Bundestag this fall. Good luck, Isabel. Uh, she, is currently a, uh, she is currently a deputy parliamentary group leader for the SPA Day in the local council and is spokeswoman for urban development and mobility. She was born in Brandenburg, uh, but she grew up also in Santiago de Chile and Hanover. Uh, thank you both so much for being here. I'm really excited for this conversation about what the sort of year, the election season ahead in Germany portends. Uh, and let me turn it over to Thomas for sort of opening remarks and his thoughts on kind of the current current state of the election. Yeah, hi to everyone and uh, thank you, Max, for the um, introduction. Maybe um, I changed my um, uh, committee membership um, right now. I'm uh, just for one year, I'm a uh, a member of the um, uh, committee for internal affairs and i um, i have to uh, uh, serve in the parliamentarisches kontrollgremium uh, which uh, uh, checks the secret service in germany it's uh, as interesting as the defense committee um, uh, but uh, i changed it last year but no problem um, uh, thank you for the um, uh, very interesting question uh, to me um, many german journalists uh, asked me in the last weeks uh, what makes the election in Rheinland-Pfalz so special and uh, are the, um, uh, the things changing to Germany about uh, the um, election in Rheinland-Pfalz. And uh, maybe the first uh, remark I will make is uh, that uh, if uh, you have a great candidate, as we had um, with Malu Dreyer, a good program with a very, very um, uh, wide uh, possibility to reach people in the society, um, uh, and a party who is uh, very interesting in uh, um, yeah, uh, giving all they have for the candidate, you can win elections in Germany um, as social democrats. And uh, I think uh, we govern uh, Rheinland-Pfalz for about 30 years, and uh, it's good that we have the possibility to govern it for uh, the next five years. Um, I think very, very... Um, uh, a uh, good thing about Rheinland-Pfalz is there are majorities 
beyond the um, uh, Christian Democrats. Um, we um, uh, have the Ampel in uh, Rheinland-Pfalz. Um, uh, we uh, uh, run the country with uh, the, um, the, the Green Party and the Liberal Party. And I think it's the first Ampel um, uh, in the whole country. And uh, right now, if you ask me what are what are the interesting things about the federal election is um, uh, that we have uh, two, two coalition opinions, two coalition opinions beyond the, um, uh, the possibility of having a grand coalition or having a coalition built between uh, CDU and the Greens. Um, the second thing is um, we, we felt it in Rheinland-Pfalz that uh, the CDU has a, a very big problem. Um, Right now, you can see that the pandemic management is a little bit problematic. Um, uh, we have it as uh, SPD um, uh, also, but uh, I think uh, most of the people are um, uh, yeah uh, took responsibility at the CDU. Um, the other thing is um, uh, that, uh, and I think uh, Isabel will uh, speak about this, uh, you have the Musk affair, the corruption affair in the CDU. It's a very big problem for them. And you have the survey situation right now in the, the whole republic. Right now, they are around about 25%, I think, 25, 27. And they started at the beginning of the pandemic crisis with the 40%. And uh, if you know the structures in the CDU and the CSU, um, uh, all the MPs um, uh, look at these surveys because uh, they try to stay as members of parliament. And if the surveys are going down, they become very nervous. Um, and uh, another point is, um, as Knut mentioned at the beginning, it's the end of the chancellorship Merkel. And right now, the Christian Democrats uh, don't know who will become uh, the next candidate for them. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the, um, uh, the party with the uh, very good perspectives, uh, the Greens, they don't have uh, a candidate at all. And right now, the Social Democratic Party um, uh, with Olaf Scholz is the only party with a program, a candidate, and uh, I hope enough power to start in the uh, super election campaign this year. Um, and uh, as you can see, um, I think the, the most important thing from Rheinland-Pfalz uh, is that we are yeah, in a very good mood for the super election year. And uh, I brought it hopefully to the um, uh, SPD fraction in the German Bundestag. Thank you, Thomas, for, for those uh, excellent opening remarks. Uh, Isabel, let me turn it over to you. I hope I'm not going to be the one who has to dampen the mood somewhat. <laughs> but <laughs> um, so we uh, in Baden-Württemberg have a slightly different uh, perspective and also position, starting position. We also had regional elections and um, the Green Party here won by far uh, the election, which uh, was also the incumbent who was um, um, re-elected which is something we've seen um, the past years that I think in almost every um, regional elections, the incumbent party has been um, re-elected, sometimes uh, with a little less uh, votes or sometimes with um, even more votes like we saw here in Baden-Württemberg. But uh, we here see a very strong uh, Green Party that is also managing to capture a large part of cons formerly conservative voters. And that is something that uh, worries me somewhat because I'm not sure whether um, as social democrats we will be able to capture um, those people who are maybe now turning away from um, the CDU because they uh, mainly voted for the CDU because of Merkel who, who's um, comparatively progressive uh, CDU leader. Uh, some have said she was one of the best social democratic chancellors of the past <laughs> 20 years. But um, so we obviously hope that we can, you know, convince some people that uh, they will be in good hands voting for the original, uh, especially because we have a candidate with Olaf Scholz, who I think embodies uh, this kind of political approach of a uh, a calm hand and also very, um, who's also very experienced and um, yeah, well respected. Um, for me in, uh, in Mannheim, I have a very um, special situation here because um, we are an industrial city, which exemplifies in many ways the 
all the challenges that we face uh, on a more global scale. We have um, one of the largest industrial production shares from any city in Germany, and the biggest employer is Daimler. And the second biggest biggest employer is the local um, 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 hospital. So I think that that exemplifies very well, like what is the challenge with, uh, within uh, we operate because we have you know the automobile industry with who's struggling, who has to reinvent himself and innovate, and we have like the public health sector who we see now in this pandemic um, will have uh, their challenges as well. So. Um, we have that um, industrial um, structural change. We have a, a large part of population, I think half of the population almost in Mannheim, who is not from a German, cult German cultural background. So we, have, we have a very diverse citizenship. We are also climatically one of the hottest regions in Germany. So we feel the climate change here. I mean, today it's like, it feels like summer outside. <laughs> so there's, I have problems with lighting here because is, the sun is shining so much. And um, I mean, we, and we also have, although we have been, we are a growing city, we're struggling with high rents and high uh, property prices. Um, on the one hand, we are growing and also prospering to some degree economically. However, we still have a very large portion of our inhabitants who are actually still dependent on, on social welfare in some form. I think from 300,000 more or less uh, people who live in Mannheim, 50,000 are uh, dependent on some sort of social welfare or social support. So that is this very eclectic mix uh, of, of, of challenges and people that we operate within and we need strong representatives. Uh, on every level who will help us with these challenges. And now we lost our uh, MP uh, because he uh, is at the center of this corruption scandal uh, within the Christian Democratic Party. Nicolas Löbe was the representative of Mannheim in the Bundestag. And he was one of the first ones where it came out that he uh, actually profited himself personally from selling uh, uh, masks and protective equipment. Um, and he's now resigned um, after some a lot of pressure was put on him. He has resigned uh, from his post and um, is now facing charges, actually, legal charges, but uh, that are not related to the mask scandal because he has other things going on as well. Uh, it's very, you, you really kind of lose uh, track of all the things that are going on. Every day I hear like some other corruption uh, scandal coming out and... Um, People have asked me, you know, wow, oh, how do you feel? You know, great for you because your opponent is um, is struggling or isn't actually gone now. However, I actually am I'm a bit wary of these developments because I do feel that it overall it damages everyone who is a public serv servant and um, works in politics. Um, I also don't know who actually is going to profit. Um, from this weakness of the uh, CDU in the end. Um, so I think, um, and also the, the actual, this corruption scandal that's going on now is somewhat overshadowed, uh, overshadowed by the poor crisis management uh, in the coronavirus uh, crisis that we see now at federal level. At least a lot of people here perceive it as poor management. And while it, it, it mainly damages the CDU, it doesn't help us either. As social democrats so it's a very um yes yeah, and a lot of moving parts people are kind of tired uh, of this whole pandemic situation and it's difficult to also address other topics and i think that we don't know what's going to happen in september it's uh, it's an open field which is also obviously an opportunity great well thank you both um let me start uh by asking whether you think this will be a, a change election uh, in America, we oftentimes refer to elections as, as whether they're, you know, whether they're elections about change or about continuity. In this case, which it's a little tricky because, of course, it's a change election. Angela Merkel will no longer be chancellor come uh, come the fall. But do you think voters in Germany are looking for the next Merkel? Uh, and if so, you know who, you know, I I I think Olaf Scholz and and obviously the CDU both have sort of claim for perhaps that mantle. 
or is this an election about change? Is this an election where you think voters are going to want sort of a new direction? And is, are these corruption scandals really sort of turning people off and wanting sort of a new direction? So is this sort of about picking continuity or is this about sort of really picking a new, a new direction? Uh, maybe Thomas, maybe I'll start with you. Ooh, um, that's not that easy because I think Germany is uh, not that progressive country. Um, I think uh, voters in Germany um, are usually a little bit uh, conservative. And uh, if I'm frank, and I always try to be, um, uh, the voters in, uh, in, in Rheinland-Pfalz are also a little bit conservative. They voted for a conservative social democratic party because um, uh, our, our programmatic uh, range, um, uh, as I mentioned it, um, uh, we had we had things about uh, industrial politics, about economic things, about uh, society questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's for my party the most important thing that uh, we uh, we have. Uh, yeah, we have this very very wide programmatic uh, answers uh, for the time after the pandemic. I think the whole economic is uh, in a in a big change. That's nothing new. We had this before Corona, but. Um, people will have a very sharp look on uh, who is the best Corona manager right now. I think that's the biggest problem for the CDU right now. Um, uh, the, they have two candidates. They have uh, Markus Söder from uh, Bavaria and they have um, uh, Armin Laschet from uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. And uh, they are very different uh, type of Corona managers, um, uh, to say it uh, a little bit. Uh, um, and I think... I think you, you can say it right now because the pandemic will not be over in September. I think I'm, this, this, is, uh, this is no secret. And um, after that, people will, will look um, and say, who's, who was the best manager on the one hand? And on the other hand, who has the best uh, answers for all these things following of uh, Corona? Isabel, over to you. I also find it really difficult to answer because uh, this Corona thing is that kind of is laying heavy on every other topic that is so uh, difficult to um, to see beyond that right now. And also for me, uh, it's even hard also to answer what the mood is because I'm not. I don't see people. I don't talk to anyone right now. I mean, you only uh, have this internet and the social media, which is a skewed view. I'm sure. Um, and so it's actually kind of difficult. It was also very difficult for me in the past election and these regional elections to really grasp at the mood of the people when you're not, you know, on the streets and talking to them, which is actually my daily work as a, you know, city councillor. I'm very much in the city uh, and, and, and that kind of um, hinders me a little bit. I think that uh, overall, if we look at the past, people before Corona weren't really dissatisfied overall with the course of the country and their personal situation, economic and otherwise. I think the, the one topic that has been uh, um, uh, in the focus has been the climate issue, where people do see a need for change uh, in the way we've been dealing until now. However, what that change entails and how it looks exactly, that they don't necessarily have thought through to the end. So they kind of know something has to happen, but don't know really exactly what, or maybe um, everyone has a different answer for that. I always say people always favor those climate policies that align well with their lifestyle. So if, uh, for example, I don't own a car and, and people who don't own a car very easily you know, of the opinion that no one needs a car and other people who, you know, uh, like to shop at their regional, local, uh, you know, farm, uh, they think that that is the solution when it's actually kind of a combination of everything and, and even much more that we need to do. So I think that that may be something that's going to be very important. Um, however, I, don't, I can't really say right now whether in, in August and September it's going to have the, the impact that it had for example, at the last uh, European elections, where it was the defining topic. Uh, it, it really depends how this corona issue uh, progresses and whether it also um, puts other topics at the forefront. For example, in the regional election, the, the education topic was huge because uh, of all this, uh, how do you manage the schools uh, during corona and uh, closing of the schools and the 
all the, the 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 gaps that we have now because of the closing of the schools and maybe that is going to be a huge topic or uh, you know other social issues so um, I don't think that people want like radical change, but they certainly do want adjustments. Great. I want to sort of unpack um, and, and, and talk a little bit more about uh, coronavirus, the, the government response and, and the politics of, of coronavirus in, in, in Germany. Uh, you know, in the U.S. election, it was a, a major topic. The, the sort of bungled response from President Trump was uh, was really seized on by by uh, Vice President Biden, but then in the end, the election was quite close, and it turned out there was probably a degree of backlash to uh, demanding, you know, mask wearing, and and there was sort of a, a counter reaction to people who uh, really wanted the economy to open back up, um, and I think overall probably played definitely played in in Vice President Biden's favor, but it was not as clear cut, I think, as, as we all thought during the actual election year. And so I'm curious, you know, Germany is also sort of, you know, is a, is a federal republic where states have a lot of uh, control and oversight over uh, how they're managing coronavirus. Uh, how, how is this playing out? How is uh, coronavirus playing out in, in uh, national politics and local politics? Uh, are different states moving in different directions? Uh, what is the sort of critique of, 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 the, of the Merkel government? Uh, and do you see that sort of becoming kind of the defining issue of, of, the, of the campaign going forward? Thomas, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think there are not that uh, big differences between the parties, um, uh, despite the, the IFD and the, uh, all these corona issues. Um, I think the the, the parties in Germany, in the um, uh, Bundestag, and uh, in most of the states work together to uh, solve all these corona problems. Um, we have uh, different, um, uh, different uh, um, leaders in the states um, uh, from different parties. We have the Greens in uh, Baden-Württemberg. We have the Social Democrats in uh, Rheinland-Pfalz, the CDU and the CSU in Bavaria and Northern Westphalia, and they work together in a construct uh, called the, the um, MPK. It's a conference between the state leaders, uh, the regional reader, uh, leaders, and the, um, uh, the chancellor. And they discuss um, uh, all these things um, uh, which uh, uh, have to be done uh, to solve the, the uh, corona um, uh, problems. Um, I think it won't be uh, the biggest question um, who, who, who has another view on Corona? If there is a virus, if you have to wear a mask, if you um, uh, uh, go uh, uh, to to uh, vac how is it vaccinate 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 no, vaccinate um, uh, yourself. Um, I think the the question is uh, about all the management issues. Um, who has the, the the highest speed in the uh, vaccinate, and uh, who has the most uh, testing capacities in this country, and who is the best who is the best manager in all these questions? It's not a, a huge political question. It's I think it's a management question right now, and uh, you see big management difference between the the regional levels. Um, uh, you can see um, uh, in my home country in Rheinland-Pfalz. We are um, uh, in the top five um, uh, of uh, all these things. And I don't know, Isabel, in uh, Baden-Württemberg, I think it's not that good right now. And in uh, uh, North, North Rhine-Westphalia, it's uh, very, very poor. Um, and I think uh, these will be the most important questions. Um, uh, um, if you look at Corona and the pandemic and uh, what uh, impact will it have on the election campaign? And Isabel, as a as a city councilor, are you sort of seeing the impacts of coronavirus on your on your city and pressures to open up and for bar, bars and restaurants that, you know, we see that here in the U.S. have constantly pushing to, to, to open, even though it might be safe. What sort of how do you think what, what's what's your sort of political sense of how this is how coronavirus is impacting this election? Um, it's it difficult to say because the frustration is so high with the whole system and actually no party has has a clean slate here either because everyone has someone who's not doing a great job I mean granted the Christian Democrats have more people who are failing us right now but I don't know if the public really um uh, differentiates that much between, you know, the different areas of the coronavirus management. And although, for example, in Baden-Württemberg, we didn't, we don't have like the best 
management and we had like a lot of avoidable mistakes, it didn't really um, affect the outcome of the election in, in the sense that the, the MP, the uh, Kretschmann from the Greens was made responsible for, for this outcome. At, at a very local level, we, we struggle with high infection rates and having to take steps to close down, which are um, in parts of the um, uh, population very unpopular, and especially in the parts that are very loud, <laughs> I feel. And um, and uh, it's kind of everyone's passing on responsibility then to the next levels, like, oh, we're not, it's not our fault. It's like the state or the region who ordered this. And then they say, you know, it's the, uh, uh, the federal level. and. And, and then the federal level says, no, it's the states who actually are messing it up. So, and I think people just want solutions. They don't want to hear who's at fault, who is not doing their job. Uh, and I really think this, this um, what is going on right now, what we see, especially within the Christian Democratic Party with the, the blame shifting and the, the kindergarten on, on top, top level where... Uh, uh, Laschet, the one candidate, and Zura, the other candidate, are like fighting it out over this corona uh, virus management. Who is going to become, you know, a chancellor candidate? And I think it's so damaging to the whole mood in the country, and it's so irresponsible. And I'm really frustrated. I actually don't want to watch coronavirus news anymore. I'm I'm really tired, and I just want, um, you know, everyone to get to work and get you know, a solution I, and also have the courage to actually, you know, implement what we need to do now, even though it's unpopular, maybe with 30, maybe with 40% of the people, it's going to be unpopular. But I also believe that in six months from now, if we manage to get out of this, it's, people are not going to remember that much. So right now it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we get out of this, it could be that we have a very different mood in August and September. I hope so. I just want to follow up. Uh, we have a question in the in the chat, and and for all those watching, uh, feel free to to write in your questions. This is a question from Frank Grossman. Uh, that what to make? What do you make uh, regarding Chancellor Merkel's recent about face, given the reaction to an Easter shutdown in the face of a third uh, coronavirus wave? Uh, is this are, are Germans and their elected representatives being somewhat unner unnerved by what looks like? perhaps an unsteady response from, from Chancellor Merkel. I think Isabel, so. yeah, yeah. They are, I think, uh, I think people just have had it. I don't know if they can really process all these things that are going on that this talk show, she said that. And then the next day, I don't know if they're processing this. I think maybe it's also sometimes a political discussion, a, a, a discussion amongst people who are, you know, very politically interested. We see all these nuances and details. I think people in general are just like really struggling and fed up uh, on a psychological level, are tired. And some of are really, I mean, some people are just tired, but are otherwise fine, you know? Other people are really like struggling with job, with income, with children. And um, yeah, so I think that the overall the mood is really bad. <laughs> I think it's gonna get better. And I think Germans also tend to over dramatize, uh, you know, uh, bad <laughs> developments like that. I think if the world is looking at Germany, they don't see it like as catastrophic as, as the mood is somewhat, but I think it's going to get better, but, you know, everyone needs to, you know, rein it in and just do the work. Maybe, you know, communicate less, maybe just do more, talk less about it. I think the whole country is tired. Uh, it's uh, as a politician, as a member of parliament, I'm tired, too. And uh, I think the whole world wants uh, that uh, Corona is over. Um, I think the, the people in the country look at... Uh, at us as uh, members of parliament and at the chancellor um, uh, and they want uh, stability, they want uh, clear rules and they want to, yeah, they want to see that uh, there is a way out of Corona. And maybe that's a little bit the problem because right now we see that we need time. It will take time to September to have all the AstraZeneca, Moderna and uh, BioNTech, Pfizer um, uh, things in, in Germany and, uh, have everyone uh, have everyone or given everyone the possibility to vaccinate and uh, I think um, that after the summer the the mood in the um, uh, in the people the people will change a little bit and um, 
I, I hope that the next uh, meeting of the regional leaders and the chancellor, they will not meet in, uh, in uh, some night meetings and uh, take decisions after five or six hours of uh, talking to each other. I think that's the biggest problem right now that uh, they, um, uh, yeah, they, they talk to each other, discuss, and then they have a decision after five, six or seven hours. And then you have these press conferences um, uh, after these uh, night meetings, And uh, then two days ago, um, uh, as the chancellor, you have to, to take the decision back. And uh, people, uh, people aren't very satisfied with this uh, ongoing. I want to ask uh, about the SPD's message going into this election cycle. Now, uh, it strikes me SPD is in a difficult position because you're both in the coalition, been part of, of the Merkel government, but are also so trying to create a distinction with the CDU and CSU, but then also face uh, a challenge on the left uh, from, uh, from the Green Party. And maybe um, if you could sort of say, what, 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 what's the SPD's message? How do you think the SPD will sort of position itself in this upcoming campaign? How will it sort of critique the CDU? And what's its sort of critique of, of the Green Party, which you know, may sort of siphon off some votes Uh, that may may from the left that may have traditionally gone to the SPD. Um, Isabel, why don't I start with you this time? I was hoping you would <laughs> give it to Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I can start with you I, I, if you want start. to. You start and I'm going to then critique what the SPD is doing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe first of all, I think it's uh, the most important thing is uh, to work hard to solve uh, the corona problems. I think you, you shouldn't start... Um, uh, to criticize um, uh, everything um, uh, what the government is doing. We are part of the government, as you mentioned, um, uh, and the people, they look very sharp on what we are doing in the government and we have to work hard to solve all these problems. They are very, yeah, these are real problems of the people in our country and we have to solve them. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, we have to give answers what's coming next what's coming after corona i talked about the change in the economics i talked about the change in the uh, industrial sector isabel talked about uh, the social ecological uh, changes and um, i think the social democrat party um, is uh, yeah we we have the best answers on all these i think very progressive um, issues um, and if we are if we are able to bring them together industrial issues, economic issues, ecological issues, and the uh, society issues, I think um, uh, this might be a good program, uh, program for uh, all these uh, things people are asking us in, in September. I actually, I agree with that. And I would add that um, we have to have the right answers, but we also have to invoke the um, confidence that we will be able to, you know, implement these answers. And, and And people have to trust us that we will be able to do it. Um, and I think that is going to be key. Who do they actually trust to tackle the issues? Because the issues that are facing us, there's no real um, debate about what the issues are. So there are differences in the answers provided by the parties, but um, they're not like widely different approaches either, if we're going to be honest. So it's not, a, it's not like in the US where you have very radical differences between the parties and even a radical perception of what the problem is, you know. So I think we in Germany have a bigger consensus of what the issues and the problems are. And um, we also don't differ extremely with uh, in, in regards to the answers. And um, I think the, for the SPD, in my point of view, the, the biggest competitor is the Green Party in this election and in, in, in the situation we are now. Um, and I would actually uh, challenge your uh, assumption that they, they are challengers from the left. <laughs> I actually think they are moving so far into the center that it's a It's very, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's astonishing to me um, how this goes, you know, uncriticized and unnoticed somewhat. And I wonder whether that is going to be uh, an issue in the, in, in the elections, in the upcoming elections, or whether it's going to help them maybe to capture some, some of those conservative voters who feel like in the end, they're just 
voting for a, a, a more ecological, greener version of the CDU, like it happened in Baden-Württemberg, or um, whether it's actually going to damage their credibility with young people and people who you know are more progressive and really want you know substantial change. Maybe if you allow, let me add um, uh, one small Please. thing. I think um, uh, the, the question of all these coalition options is uh, another big one. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I think it's uh, it's good for the for the SPD that there are right now different coalition options. We have the um, uh, the ample or the traffic light uh, with the Greens and the um, uh, and the Liberals, and we have the uh, red red green option. Um, yeah, we have uh, the option of another um, grand coalition. I hope not, but um, uh, there are uh, different options for us to uh, um, uh, run for the for the chancellery. Um, and I think right now that's a little problem of the CDU. There is just one real option, and the option is uh, with the Greens. And uh, right now they have to, to look for themselves what's possible with their program, with their candidate. And uh, um, I, I felt it in 2013 and 17 the last two election campaigns. At the end of the campaign, the people asked me, hmm, there is no coalition option for the SPD. What do you think? How do we will, um, uh, uh, how do we will uh, uh, get someone in the chancellery? And uh, I don't, I, I can't answer these questions, uh, 2013, 2017, because um, uh, in these election campaigns, we said no to all coalition models there. We said no to a red, red, green. There was no traffic light. Um, we don't want the coalition with the CDU. And I think that's one of the biggest failures you can uh, do um, uh, to say no to all these coalition options at the beginning of the election campaign. What, one um, uh, factor that I want to sort of touch on that was of particular interest in the U.S. was uh, the rise of AF Day uh, and the regional elections, the state elections that just occurred, uh, AF Day did rather terribly. Um, and Isabel, I was wondering, you know, given uh, your position in Mannheim and sort of what we've seen in the U.S. And in particular with the rise of kind of populism and Trump's base really taking root in sort of in, in post-industrial areas, especially in the U.S. and the upper Midwest, um, what what you sort of saw in, in this election uh, with the AFD uh, and, 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 and with your voters? Yes, actually, it was very interesting. We had uh, in Mannheim, we had a direct mandate for the AFD in the past uh, regional elections. So they, they had the highest um, you know, percentage from all the candidates in a, what would used to be a, a social democratic stronghold. And it was a shock 2016, we were so shocked. And this time they fell so badly, they didn't even, uh, it, it wasn't even enough to get their candidate over, um, through the, you know, the second mandate. Even if you don't win directly, you can um, get in. But they, they performed so poorly here that they, they didn't even get in um, with a candidate from Mannheim. Um, and uh, what we see in the numbers clearly is that the voters of the FC stayed at home. So we have a, a sharp decline in um, uh, participation and that accounts uh, almost 100% for their uh, drop in, um, in, uh, in the election. So um, for me, it's very clear from that that, uh, the only, that there is not really a way to win them back but more so to kind of frustrate them or demobilize them so they will stay at home. Maybe they, they stayed at home also because they do not agree with the uh, with what the FDA is saying to coronavirus because they're not everyone, you know, is crazy who voted for FDA and they didn't see, you know, the virus. They have maybe have families uh, who was affected and, and, and all those factors contributed to, you know, um, the FDA losing credibility in with the voters that they decided to stay at home, but they are not really approachable for other parties. So that is a, a reality with which we have to, you know, deal that it's, I also don't see it as, as a social democratic, you know, um, task to get those people back uh, to the uh, democratic spectrum. I think that our voters are, you know, people who um, who believe in democracy and believe in, in the law and order and um, want, you know, rules and uh, justice. And uh, therefore, I think that the way the AfD is handling them themselves is probably the best 
way to, um, I mean, to, to let just let them diminish themselves. And at the same time, you know, as, as democratic parties, all of us, you know, strengthening this democratic uh, values. Thomas. I think we have to be strong on ourselves. Um, uh, only with a strong social democratic party, with a with a good program and a good candidate, um, uh, you will be you will be strong. And I think it's a failure to always talk about uh, IFD and how bad they are, and uh, to hope that this move to bring uh, these people back to um, uh, to to uh, so the, the social democratic party or things like that. Um, we. We saw in uh, Rheinland-Pfalz that we, um, with a good good work in these cities, there um, uh, in these uh, strongholds of the IFD, smaller strongholds, we can uh, we brought some of these voters back to uh, to the Social Democratic Party. We had these uh, little offices in Ludwigshafen, um, uh, for example, that's the uh, neighborhood to, to Isabel's uh, Mannheim, and uh, we worked in these neighborhoods uh, with the people. And uh, some of them uh, uh, went back to uh, to the SPD, and I think that's uh, the only good answer. Um, if you think about how to bring people back from AfD to SPD, you have to work hard for them. Point. Not uh, bringing the SPD um, uh, to a right wing or things like that. What's discussed in the past? I think the the only answer is work hard for the people and um, uh, be strong for yourself. Great. Yeah, that is sort of the experiment going on here in the U.S. where the idea of trying to win them, win people back by uh, implementing change. And where Biden today is announcing a massive infrastructure spending bill. Um, and and one, one question there on the economy, uh, one of the major uh, issues actually in US-German relations early in the Obama era was uh, Germany's embrace of austerity, uh, handling of the Greek debt crisis, and given now, you know, going forward uh, in, in Europe, that debt will be a big issue, budget deficits, uh, wh where does the SPD position itself um, on the need to balance budgets? Is that going to be a priority or are you going to sort of follow, in some ways US, <laughs> or follow the U.S. model where we are, we are going to spend to get our economy moving again? I know Olaf Scholz was a, 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 a played a big role in the European recovery package in pushing that. Uh, where is the SPD positioning itself on on kind of issues of of, of, of fiscal issues? Yeah, I think you have to invest in a crisis. Um, that's what we're doing um, uh, for about a year. Um, we're investing uh, billions over billions um, uh, to the economy, economics, and um, uh, I think um, after. Uh, when, when Corona is over, you can't even say there will be no more. Um, you have to invest after Corona at all. Um, and let's see if uh, all these uh, all these uh, economic changes we saw um, before Corona, um, maybe if they will um, if they will change the view of uh, some people in the conservative parties um, uh, in all these questions you asked me. I think I, I agree uh, that it's uh, balancing budgets. It's going to be a challenge. Although I think that the conservative and the liberals are going to push in that direction. However, I also think that the SPD and everyone actually has to be a bit careful uh, with the spending uh, issue because um, there is a danger of inflation. If the whole world now starts spending like crazy, which I think that it will happen and um, and that could strip, you know, a lot of people of their savings. So I, I, there's a social justice issue there. So I, I, I'm, I'm very worried about what this pandemic is going to do to the economy in general on a global scale, because um, every, every country had, has this problem. Now, everyone ran up dead like crazy. There was no other option, obviously. And how are we going get, to get rid of that? And I think, obviously, we were going to propose that uh, the um, the burden of Corona is going to have to be placed on those who can carry it most, uh, the rich people uh, and the wealthy. However, we have to, I think, be careful with the, with the spending part as well. We have to be responsible. I disagree uh, on a, a very small point because um, uh, we started with a thing called Kurzarbeitergeld. I don't know what's the the right word in uh, in English, but um, 
I think that was the most effective measure um, uh, in the uh, in facing the corona pandemics in an economic way. Um, with that, we gave the the perfect short time work. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Knut. Uh, it's short time work, and we we financed um, uh, that uh, all the. Um, all these smaller, um, uh, uh, all these small, smaller um, uh, fabricants, uh, etc., in, in Germany can restart after Corona, and uh, they yep. can restart very fast. And I think in the US, as you can see, um, you had about uh, 50 million unemployed. Uh, is it right? Um, uh, last year, and in Germany, have you the, the real scale? What was it? Uh, I, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but the numbers went very high because, massive yeah yeah so we had higher unemployment i think in germany you kept people in their jobs we then increased the money that we were giving people who claimed unemployment so people would claim unemployment but get paid actually more than oftentimes what they were getting when they were working in low especially low-wage jobs um but it ended up i think roughly being uh, equivalent in sort of how we sort of stabilize the economy. But you're right that our intervention came by having to pass these sort of big stimulus bills, but yours came in providing money to employers to keep people on the job, which um, I think both were, I think yours is probably in some ways more sensible uh, than, than, than our, our response. I want to sort of maybe yeah. shift to, to foreign policy. Uh, there's a question from Michael Meyer um, in the chat that, Ask, you know, if there is sort of a coalition of the left, of, of the Green Party, of the SPD, of Die Linke, what, what, what are the foreign policy differences, uh, when it, especially when it comes to transatlantic relations, between the, the, the three parties? And, and, and where, uh, where would the SPD sort of sit in, in, in that uh, coalition? What would the SPD push for on foreign policy? Thomas, maybe I'll start with you. I think it would be uh, easier with the um, uh, the liberals and the greens um, uh, to have uh, answers on all these uh, inter international questions. If you think about NATO and the two percent issue, if you think about um, uh, nuclear rearmament, and uh, if you think about politics, um, uh, uh, Russian politics, um, and and all these things. But um, we started to talk to some people in the left too. And uh, right now they have a discussion in the left party about the role of the Bundeswehr, about the armed forces in the society and uh, about the future of the armed forces. Um, if you ask me personally, I prefer um, uh, for all these um, uh, international um, uh, issues and questions, I prefer a coalition with the liberals and the Greens. I think it might be um, easier um, uh, to, to stay transatlantic and to deal with uh, the partners in the US um, as, uh, if uh, you have a coalition with the, um, uh, the, the left and the Greens. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can agree with that. I, not only because of foreign issues, I would prefer a coalition with uh, uh, liberals and the Greens, uh, to be honest. Um, but that is certainly a big part of it. However, I do feel that it is not a bad thing if Germany, you know, develops or keeps having a, a somewhat independent also stance on foreign policy issues. It doesn't have to always be, you know, what um, the transatlantic partnership demands. It can uh, correct uh, some of those uh, policies and also, you know, give us a um, leeway to have our own partnerships for example you know this whole Nord Stream issue uh, between Germany and Russia I do not agree with the U.S. policy on that uh, and how they, they evaluate that and I think we have as social democrats have enough or as Germany have enough you know um, independence and confidence to have our own stances in some issues as well. Let me ask follow up on on defense spending that is sort of uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, President Trump made that sort of, you know, the key issue for U.S.-German relations. Uh, that was, but it was also an issue during uh, the Obama era, and I think will remain an issue under President Biden, where the U.S. will push for greater defense spending by Germany, and, in, and you know, particularly sort of the poor state of the, of the German military currently. Um, what, what is the SPD's view on defense spending? There's also been efforts to, uh, uh, by Emmanuel Macron to sort of push, uh, in particular, to push for 
uh, more EU defense efforts, where, where would the SPD uh, sort of stand on, on in the platform on, on, on defense spending? Maybe, um, Thomas, I'll start with you and then go to Isabel. Yeah, we increased the defense budget uh, in the last years. Um, it was uh, the SPD in the um, uh, coalition who helped to increase the defense spending. And that's that was the, the right answer to that time because uh, I, I don't have to repeat all the uh, tensions uh, between uh, the NATO and Russia and the change in the world and things like that. We increased it. Um, I'm not sure if the 2% um, uh, idea of the NATO is the, the right answer um, uh, on all these uh, questions, because um, if you look right now on the economic situation in Germany, we are very uh, close to the 2% uh, 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 thing. And um, uh, we are getting closer and closer because our um, uh, economic situation is uh, getting worse and worse. Um, uh, but uh, this does not mean that the Bundeswehr, the armed forces are in a better shape. Um, I think the, the most important question is uh, how can we, um, how can we um, talk to our partners in the NATO to share um, uh, uh, all these, um, um, less, uh, I'm searching for the words, um, uh, the Aufgabenverteilung, um, uh, how we can, uh, yeah, burden sharing, right, that's it. <laughs> Um, uh, I think we have to talk about that. Um, uh, another question of uh, um, uh, someone on YouTube was um, about Afghanistan. And uh, I think that's, these are the, the most important question. Um, the world is changing right now. And uh, Germany is uh, um, a, a bigger player in the world than we, are, um, than we were 20 years ago. Um, and you will see it in the defense budget in the future. It's not the only answer because uh, we have... Uh, the foreign ministry right now and uh, all the diplomatic things, um, uh, but it's some part of the of the answer for the future. Isabel, maybe you could sort of unpack what are the public views when it comes to the German military and, and defense spending, at least from your perspective. Um, I think uh, Germany widely is not really uh, enthusiastic about military spending. <laughs> or um, um, foreign commitments of the Bundeswehr. However, you know, a large portion of the, uh, uh, of the citizens do accept that it's necessary. Um, when it comes to um, defense spending, I think uh, the, the overall feeling, and it's actually mine as well, is that we maybe need to look more at the qualitative improvement of our armed forces rather than just at the quantitative, you know, improvement, because there is a lot... To be, um, uh, to be improved in the processes within the Bundeswehr and the efficiency and the equipment. And, and obviously those things are tied to spending and budget as well, but not only to budget because there, there has been like a lot of mismanagement uh, over the past you know, 20 years that the CDU has been leading the defense department. I think it, it would be good to have change there. And from what I gather also from people I know within the armed forces, that is kind of the overall feeling to know, you know, uh, maybe we get our army to a place where they can actually contribute on a qualitatively uh, um, better level than it is uh, right now. And um, as to, you know, a military or defense engagement abroad, uh, people are always skeptical. And I think uh, you always have to you know, look case by case, uh, whether it seems uh, appropriate, uh, the response and where, whether it's yielding the results that we hoped it would yield. And obviously a coalition with the left will uh, make it very much more difficult to fulfill the international commitments we have made thus far, and uh, even more difficult to engage into further commitments if that would be you know, the ambition. And I think we will see after Trump, um, uh, also under Biden, um, uh, things that we saw under Obama, um, that uh, the Europe states have to work together in a better way to, um, uh, to secure our continent. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Trump did it with other words, but I think that the meaning um, uh, also of the, of the new Biden administration in, the, um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in these questions are the same. They look to Germany and they say to us, um, please raise your budget and look at European security, maybe on your own. We are partners, we are in, a, in, in the NATO, but you have to uh, look at your own security. And 
I think I think that's right. I, I agree as well. And uh, we have just a few minutes left. And before I turn it over for closing comments, um, perhaps in your closing comments, you know, the, Europe uh, is is obviously um, going to be watching this election very closely, wanting to see where Germany will head, since Germany can oftentimes uh, chart the course for the future direction of, of, of the EU, of the European project. Um, maybe in your closing remarks, you could touch on you know, where you see Germany's role going in, in the SPD going ahead uh, for for Europe and what, what the selection will mean for Europe, especially with a post-Merkel future. Um, maybe uh, I'll, I'll start maybe with Isabel for your closing thoughts and then turn it over to Thomas. Yes, I think that the European partnership engagement has to be strengthened because it this whole pandemic management and the vaccination was not the best uh, uh, advertisement for the European Union and um, it has the, the image has suffered however I think there is a chance to get out of this crisis together to do this as a, co uh, a common effort and I think this the SPD would be well placed you know to lead those efforts because uh, what we have seen in the past uh, years under um, um, leadership from the CDU was not the kind of Europe politic uh, that we would have liked. And I think there is much more potential to work together, actually also not only on federal level, but on local level as well. For example, Mannheim does that at, at different levels. We are very involved with the European Committee of Regions. We are part of the local Green New Deal. We were gonna start a process for a local Green New Deal. There are so many things people don't actually know about. And I think um, on many levels, this partnership with the EU could be strengthened and the federal, a new federal government could highlight, highlight those efforts more and not only look at Europe as, you know, some you know, difficult task that is just costing us money, but actually a driver for positive change. So I think there's a huge opportunity there and I hope people will see it however difficult it may be at the moment because of also the underperforming, you know, city you minister who is at the head of the EU right now. So that's a problem. Thomas, final thoughts. Yeah, my my constituency is uh, very close to France. Um, and uh, I think we have to rebuild Europe in a way. We have to close the borders to our next neighbor, to France in the pandemic. Um, uh, people who live on the one side of the border can't even go to their families on the other side of the border. And um, that, that changes something in, uh, in the mind of the people. And I, I think we have, we have to, uh, to build a new vision of Europe because right now we are a little bit in a, in a, in a conflict between the systems. You see uh, Russia and China trying to, uh, to engage in these times and show that their political systems are better than the European system and that system in the US. Um, uh, and right now, some people in uh, Europe um, uh, maybe think the same. And uh, we have to, to strengthen Europe. We have to strengthen the idea of Europe. And we have to strengthen the idea of uh, all the institutions in Europe. If you don't do that, I think um, you will see in some countries um, uh, nationalist movements um, who try to uh, to use the situation to change maybe all these uh, ideas um, uh, yeah, our fathers and grandfathers uh, built in Europe. I hope that um, uh, it will be part of the election campaign and maybe uh, part of the, the, the political fighting between the parties who, has the, who have the best ideas for Europe and uh, I hope the next leader of the of the country will be um, a European citizen uh, by his heart. Um, I know Olaf Scholz um, uh, is a European citizen by his heart. And uh, yeah, let's let's see. Um, I think Isabel and, and I will fight for the Social Democrat Party. And uh, um, I'm in a good mood at all. And I think uh, it will be the most exciting um, uh, election campaign we had um, over the last uh, 16 or 20 years. I'm looking forward. Great. Well, we are at the hour mark and, and given German punctuality, I don't wanna run over time. So I wanna thank you both for, uh, for what was a very interesting discussion. Uh, the title of this event, Wide Open Field, uh, Germany's Super Election Year. I think it is definitely a wide open, uh, wide open field. And, and thank you for enlightening us uh, with your perspective 
on what is, I think, one of the most important elections of the year and will have immense significance for Europe and the United States. And best of luck to both of you as you uh, engage, uh, endeavor in this, uh, in this competitive election ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, yeah, I'm Max Bergman and uh, hope to, to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.